Where are Elmer, Herman, Bert, Tom, and Charlie? The weak of will, the strong of arm, the clown, the boozer, the fighter. All, all are sleeping on the hill. One passed in a fever. One was burned in a mine. One was killed in a brawl. One died in a jail. One fell from a bridge, toiling for children and wife. All, all are sleeping, sleeping, sleeping on the hill. Where are Ella, Kate, Mag, Lizzie, and Edith? The tender heart, the simple soul, the loud, the proud, the happy one? All, all are sleeping on the hill. One died in shameful childbirth, one of a thwarted love, one at the hands of a brute in a brothel, one of a broken pride in the search for heart's desire, one after life in faraway London and Paris was brought to her little space by Ella and Kate and Mag. All, all are sleeping, sleeping sleeping on the hill. Where are Uncle Isaac and Aunt Emily and Old Towny Kincaid and Savine Houghton and Major Walker, who had talked with venerable men of the Revolution? All, all are sleeping on the hill. They brought them dead sons from the war and daughters whom life had crushed and their children fatherless crying. All, all are sleeping, sleeping, sleeping on the hill. Where is old Fiddler Jones, who played with life all his ninety years, braving the sleet with bared breast, drinking, rioting, thinking neither of wife nor kin, nor gold, nor love, nor heaven, Lo, he babbles of the fish fries of long ago, of the horse races of long ago at Clary's Grove, of what Abe Lincoln said one time at Springfield. I was 16, and I had the most terrible dreams, and specks before my eyes, and nervous weakness, and I couldn't remember the books I read, like... Frank Drummer, who memorized page after page, and my, my back was weak, and I worried and worried, and I was embarrassed and stammered my lessons, and when I stood up to recite, I'd forget everything that I had learned. Well, I saw Dr. Weiss's advertisement, and there I read everything in print, just as if he had known me and about the dreams, which I couldn't help. And so I knew I was marked for an early grave. And I worried until I had a cough. And then the dreams stopped. And I slept the sleep without dreams here on the hill by the river. Where is my boy, my boy? In what far part in the world? The boy I love most in school. I, the teacher, the old maid, the virgin heart, who made them all my children. Did I know my boy all right? Thinking of him as spirit of flame, active, ever aspiring. Oh, boy, boy, who for who I prayed and prayed. I, many hours, a night. Do you remember the letter I wrote you of the beautiful love of the Christ? And whether or not you took it, wherever you are, work for your soul's sake. That all the clay of you, all the drowse of you, all the fire of you, that there is nothing but love. Nothing but love. I am Minerva. 
the village poetess, hooted at, jeered at by the yahoos of the street for my rolling body, cock eye, and rolling walk. And all the more so when Butch Weldy captured me after a brutal hunt, and he left me to my fate with Dr. Myers, and I sank into death, growing numb from the feet up like stepping into an icy stream. Will someone go to the village newspaper for me and gather into a book the verses I wrote? I thirsted so for love. I hungered so for life. Horses and men are just alike. There was my stallion, Billy Lee, black as a cat, trim as a deer, with an eye of fire and keen to start, and he could hit the fastest speed of any race around Spoon River. But just as you think he couldn't lose with his lead of 50 yards or more, he'd rear himself and throw the rider, and fall back over, completely gone to pieces, tangled up. You see, he was a perfect fraud. He couldn't win, he couldn't work. He was too light to haul the plow with, and nobody wanted colts from him. And when I tried to drive him well, he ran away and killed me. At four o'clock in late October, I sat alone in the country schoolhouse, back from the road, mid strip of fields, and an eddy of wind blew leaves on the pane and crooned in the flue of the cannon stove, with its open door blurring the shadows, with the spectral glow of a dying fire. In an idle mood, I was running the planchette. All at once, my wrist grew limp and my hand moved rapidly over the board till the name of Charles Gateau was spelled, who threatened to materialize before me. I rose and fled from the room bareheaded into the dusk, afraid of my gift. After that, the spirit swarmed. Chaucer, Caesar, Poe, Marlowe, Cleopatra, Mrs. Surat. Wherever I went with messages, mere trifling twaddle, Spoon River. You talk nonsense to children, don't you? And suppose I see what you never saw, never heard of, and have no word for. I must talk nonsense when you ask me what it is I see. They have chiseled on my stone the words, His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him, That nature might stand up and say to all the world, This was a man. Those who knew me smile as they read this empty rhetoric. My epitaph should have read, Life was not so gentle to him, and the elements so mixed in him that he declared warfare on life, in the which he was slain. While I was alive, I could not cope with slanderous tongues, and now that I am dead, I must submit to an epitaph written by a fool. Their spirits beat upon mine like the wings of a thousand butterflies. I closed my eyes and felt their spirits vibrating. I closed my eyes, yet I knew when their lashes fringed their cheeks and downcast eyes, and when they turned their heads, and when their garments clung to them or fell from them in squeezing. Their spirits watched my ecstasy with wide look of starry unconcern. Their spirits looked upon my torture. They drank it as it were the water 
life. But with reddened cheeks, brightened eyes, with the rising flame of my soul, may their spirits gilt like the wings of a butterfly drifting suddenly into sunlight. And they cried to me for life, life, life. But in taking life for myself, in seizing and crushing their souls like a child crushes grapes and drinks from its palms the purple juice. I came to this wingless boy. Red, nor gold, nor wine, nor the rhythm of life is known. From Bindle's Opera House in the village to Broadway is a great step. But I tried to take it. My ambition fired when, 16 years of age, seeing East Lynn played here in the village by Ralph Barry, the coming romantic actor who enthralled my soul. True. I trailed back home, a broken failure, when Ralph disappeared in New York, leaving me alone in the city. But life broke him also. In all this place of silence, there are no kindred spirits. How I wish Duza could stand amid the pesos of these quiet fields and read these words. Henry got me with child, and when I could not bring forth losing my own. Therefore, in my youth, I entered the portals of dust. Traveler, it is believed, in the village where I live, that Henry loved me with a husband's love. But I proclaim from the dust that he slew me to gratify his hatred. I was the laughing stock of the village, chiefly of the people of good sense, as they liked to call themselves. Also of Reverend Keat, who could read Greek the same as English. For instead of talking free trade, or preaching some form of baptism, instead of believing in the efficacy of walking cracks, picking pins up the right way, seeing the new moon over the right shoulder, or curing rheumatism with blue glass, I asserted the sovereignty of my own soul. Before Mary Baker, G. Eddy, had even begun what she would call science, I had mastered the Bhagavad Gita and cured my own soul. Before Mary began to cure bodies with souls, peace to all worlds. He protested his whole life long. But the newspapers Lied about him villainously. And it was not his fault for Minerva's fall. And he was only trying to help her. Poor soul, sunk so in sin that he could not see it. That he was only trying to help her as he said that he had broken a law, both human and divine. Passers-by 
an ancient admonition to you. If your ways be ways of pleasantness, and your path lead to peace, love God and his commandments. My life's blossom might have bloomed on all sides, save for a bitter wind, which stunted my petals on the side of me, which you in the village could see. From the dust, I lift a voice of protest, to my flattering side you never saw. You live in once ye are fools indeed, who do not know the ways of the wind, or the unseen forces that govern the processes of life. Yes, here I lie, close to a stunted rose bush in a forgotten place near the fence, where thickets from Seaver's woods have crept over, growing sparsely. And you, you are a leader in New York, the wife of a noted millionaire, a name in the society columns, beautiful, admired, magnified perhaps by the mirage of distance. You have succeeded. I have failed in the eyes of the world. You are alive. I am dead. Yet I know that I vanquished your spirit, and I know that lying here, far from you, unheard of among your great friends, in the brilliant world where you move, I am really the unconquerable power over your life that robs it of complete triumph. Together in this grave lie Benjamin Bandia, attorney at law, and Nick, his dog, constant companion, solace, and friend. Down the gray road, friends, children, men and women, passing one by one out of life, left me till I was alone with Nick for a partner, bedfellow, comrade, and friend. In my younger days, I knew aspiration and saw glory. Then she, who survived me, snared my soul with a snare which bled me to death, till I, one strong will, lay broken, indifferent, living in a back room of a dingy office. Under my jawbone is snuggled the bony nose of Nick, our story is lost in silence. My thanks, friends of the County Scientific Association, for this modest boulder and its little tablet of bronze. Twice I tried to join your honor body and was rejected. When my little brochure on the intelligent plants began to pick up recognition, you almost voted me in. After that, I grew beyond the need of you and your recognition. But yet I do not reject your memorial stone, seeing that I should in so doing deprive you of honor to yourselves. Oh, you young radicals and dreamers, you dauntless fledglings who pass by my headstone, mock it not for my captaincy in the army and my faith. They're not denials of each other. Go by reverently and read with sober care how a great people writing with defiant shouts the centaur of revolution spurred and whipped by frenzy shook in terror seeing the mists of the sea over the precipice of which they were nearing, and fell from his back in precipitate awe to celebrate the feast of the Supreme Being, moved by the same sense of vast reality of life and death and burdened by each with the fate of a race. How was I, a little blasphemer, caught up in the nation's unloosed flood, remain a blasphemer and a captain of the army? Mm -hmm.